In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please kneel for confession. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, for our redemption, you gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of the enemy. Grant that all our sin may be drowned through daily repentance, and that day by day we may arise to live before you in righteousness and purity forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this Easter morning comes to us from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that has cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations, he will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people will, will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle comes from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for the proclamation of good news is in Mark chapter 16, where the women go to the tomb. And they find that it is empty, just as he had said. You may be seated. Back in Transfiguration Sunday in February at a children's message, we took this banner of Alleluia's. And Pastor Woodfin has longer arms than me, and he, he held it wide like that. And then we buried it into this wood case. And then we had that wood case underneath the cross for all of Lent. And Easter, we unbury the Alleluia because indeed our Savior isn't buried any longer. There were, the word Alleluia means praise the Lord. And if it was Vacation Bible School, we might do a little praise ye the Lord, uh, stand up and sit down song here. But what I love about this word is it just, it brings a dialogue. I say Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen and I love that throughout the Easter season, that dialogue shapes the Christian community, that we have this shared language. Part of this sermon, I'm going to have another thing we're going to dialogue with. And this one, some people know, some don't, we'll practice. So throughout the sermon at different times, I'm going to say, this is the day the Lord has made. And you're going to respond. Ah, you, you, you're so good. But we're going to practice anyways. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Because you see, Easter is the day the Lord has made for us. Today is a great day. It's a day that, that changes all other times. It takes everything that we had thought was going to be permanent and makes it temporary, and everything we thought was going to be temporary and makes it permanent. It changes everything from being in the darkness to now in the light. Before we talk too much about this day, though, I want to move backwards a couple days to Friday. Christ is on the cross. He breathes his last. He dies. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who had earlier come to Jesus in the night, they both worked to take the body of Jesus down from that cross and there on that hill where he was crucified nearby, there was a garden, and in that garden was a new tomb. And so Joseph and Nicodemus, they wrapped the body of Jesus in a linen shroud, and Nicodemus had brought 75 pounds of oils and spices to anoint the body, and then they placed it into that tomb, and they, they sealed the stone. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, they saw the place where Jesus was laid. And then Saturday, and its silence, and the stillness of the Sabbath rest. Then Mark 16 begins, that early in the morning, as the sun had just risen, the women are now returning back to the tomb, and they have brought with them spices, even though they would have seen Nicodemus, you know. Women, uh, they want to do it themselves. And, and they, so they're talking and they're wondering who's going to roll the stone. And their eyes are down, and I, I just, I completely understand their eyes being down. Because the next phrase is, and they looked up. But how many times have you walked in that beginning light of the morning, and it's still dark, and you, you have to have your eyes down just to make sure you can see where you're going, and you don't want to trip. But I don't think that'd be the only reason their eyes would be down. I found in moments of anxiousness, awkwardness, where conversation is filled with apprehension. It's hard to make eye contact even with the people you're talking to. I think their eyes would have been down partly because of the early morning light, but more just because it's hard to look up. When the hope that you had had in the Messiah, that you thought the anointed one had arrived to bring the kingdom of heaven into the world, and you had now witnessed him dying on the cross, and you saw the place where he was laid and the stone sealed, yeah, the eyes are down, thinking that their hope is permanently gone. And when they look up and they see that the stone has been rolled away, they enter into the tomb. 
And that stone to be rolled away, they, they were going to just roll it away just for a temporary moment to walk into their place of spices. It, it's a stone that, from evidence, we kind of know probably what it was. It was a stone in a groove. And to keep it open, you'd put a wedge into that, that groove. So they were expecting to roll the stone somehow and get that wedge in there and then temporarily walk into there. And then the stone would seal again and it'd be permanently closed. But they arrive and it's open. And they step into the tomb and there's a, a young man sitting on the right side and his words are the words that kind of echo now throughout all of, uh, all of time. He says, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified one. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you to Galilee. There you'll see him just as he told you. The, the invitation is, first of all, don't be alarmed. This is good news. Now come and see the place where the crucified one, the one who has risen, where he had laid. But then I love this invitation that from seeing, it goes to telling. And to tell the disciples, and, and then Mark includes this detail, and Peter. Peter, a follower of Jesus, and the night of the trial had denied the Lord, and the rooster had crowed, and Peter had known that he had crumbled in his, his own strength. But now the young man, this angelic man, is telling the women to go tell the disciples and Peter. Peter, who had thought maybe he was always and permanently on the outside, his being brought back in. It's a remarkable thing to hear that the day has arrived and that expectation of death being permanent, the temporariness of anointing the body has now been flipped. Death is, is temporary and the tomb is permanently empty. And they move to that tomb with despair, but now they are going to be invited to move and tell the good news. This reassuring voice of this young man that he, he, he brings into a fear-filled world a message that now changes everything. And I was thinking about time and how... Well, John records that it was still dark. Mark says that it was early in the morning and the sun had just risen. It, it tells me that everything that had happened in this tomb to make it empty happened in the dark. The spiritual clock timing of things is that when they arrived in the day, they were becoming witnesses to a work that God had already been doing. And I, I think about that to know that there are many moments of darkness in my own life, whether it's a physical darkness or more a spiritual darkness, and wondering and waiting to see how God is at work. And yet this... This day that the Lord is making is a day that had already begun in the dark. And that when we confess with our dialogue about the day the Lord is, we're going to do that in just a moment, realize what God is doing in that day, he had already started in the dark. And so as we're saying this phrase, again, I'm afraid of starting it because I think you're going to echo real quickly on me. <laughs> but everything we're confessing, is about something God had already started. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As you speak those words, I want you to know that God had already been working in the dark to bring the light into the world. Our spiritual clock time, for some, you may still be in times of darkness. Others, you're in an early morning. You're, your eyes are down, but the moment soon is going to arrive when you're going to look up and you're going to see your hope has arrived. For others, the day has been long and you're now on the road to Emmaus and you're leaving and you're a little confused. But even there in that long day, the Lord is going to walk with you. Wherever your spiritual clock time is at, I want you to understand in your mind the timing of the women. So just to, first of all, have your mind set on this, that when they arrived in the tomb, God had already done his work. But now I want you to have your heart set on this too, that when your heart is engulfed 
and an all-encompassing frustration that God is already at work. And, and this is a pattern that God has been doing throughout the Scriptures. I'm going to share with you now four stories from the Old Testament where there's something that happens in the dark and the people see it in the light. And I want you to have now confidence that even if we're in a fear-filled world where there is darkness engulfing us, that God is already at work. The first one I'm going to tell you is 1 Samuel chapter 5. This has got some humor in it. The Philistines have captured the Ark of the Covenant and they have taken it from Ebenezer where the Hebrews had their tabernacle and they've taken it to Ashdod, their kind of capital city where they've got a temple built to their, their god Dagon. Dagon is an idolatrous false god, but the Philistines are following him. They put the Ark of the Covenant next to Dagon. Night passes. In the morning, they go in, and 1 Samuel chapter 5, 3 says, The people of Ashdod rose early the next day. Behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they set Dagon back up. Maybe, you know, there was just some sort of tremble in the ground. He fell. Maybe someone who had set him up in place. They didn't make sure the wedges were in place. Some mistake, maybe. But in verse 4, it says, The next day... He fell again, this time with his hands and his head fallen off on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. I love this imagery of how the people had tried to control the Ark of the Covenant, but during the night the Lord caused Dagon to fall to the ground. It's just the humor of it. And the second night, his hands falling off. Dagon cannot embrace anybody. His head falls off. He can't have any wisdom or speak any encouraging words to anybody. It's the Ark of the Lord that delivers the covenant into the world. Isaiah 37. Now, this is taking place 720 B.C. So 720 years before the birth of Christ, the Assyrians are the bad guys. And the Assyrians are coming down from the north. They've already destroyed the ten northern kingdoms. And now they're laying siege to Jerusalem. And King Hezekiah is spending all night in the temple, on his knees, praying to the Lord that the Lord will provide refuge and be a fortress of protection against Sennacherib's army of 185,000 people. And while Hezekiah is praying, the angel of the Lord goes amongst that army, brings great fear to them in the night. And then Isaiah 37, verse 36 says, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down the 185,000. When the people arose early in the morning, behold, there were all dead bodies among their enemies. I, I want you to have that sense that the night was spent in fear, but the day brought the joy of knowing the Lord was with them. Another one in Daniel 6. So in Daniel 6, you've got King Darius, and he's got backed into a corner. He's been kind of forced in his hand to put Daniel in the lion's den. And it says, Early in the morning, King Darius hurried to the lion's den, and to his great relief, he found that Daniel was alive. And then King Darius announces that it was the mighty living God of Daniel made this possible. The night was filled with fear, but Daniel was kept safe in that lion's den. Judges 6, here's another one, last one, but I, th I think... You should be getting the pattern by now, right? Gideon is being called by God to be a deliverer, a judge. And he destroys his father's altar that his father had built to the idolatrous false god named Baal. And his father had also planted a grove of trees right next to that altar as a dedication to Asherah, a female deity. At night, Gideon destroyed that altar mowed down the grove of trees and built up an altar to God. And then, so Judges chapter 6, verse 28 says, When the people of the town rose early in the morning. Again, you hear that phrase, early in the morning. Behold, they saw the altar of Baal taken down and the Asherah was cut down. This is the day the Lord has made. So go early in the morning. While the sun is still rising, while your eyes may be cast down, and look up and see that it is true. The tomb is empty. Go and see the place where he was laid. It is, it is empty, just as he had promised. And now, with your mind, you can do all of that. You can kind of read the text. You can follow along. But take that what is in your mind 
and put into your heart and push away from your heart all the darkness. Push away from your heart all the fear that has filled the night and place into that heart the space of promise that it is now permanent and true that Christ is risen from the dead. And let your hands now move with the confidence of embrace that comes, not from anointing a dead body, but embracing the living God. He is living for you. And so, again, no matter where your spiritual clock is running right now, God is at work. He's been at work in the night. He's been at work in the early morning. And he is at work in the long day's journey when confusion is still ripe. He is still at work. Because this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand now and confess your faith. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you kept your promise and delivered up your own Son to be our Savior. By his sacrificial death, our sins are forgiven, and by his rising again, we have the hope of everlasting life. Keep us in this holy joy throughout the Easter season and all our days that we live that we may not fear our enemies nor give in to the temptation of despair in our days of trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, be with all our pastors. Keep them faithful to deliver to your people the apostolic gospel of your son's death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, let us hold fast to the word preached to us that receiving it with joy, we may take our stand in it and be saved by it. Grant us courage to confess its truth in our life and conversations. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, bless all who serve us in local, state, and national government. Move them to protect the innocent, helpless, and the marginalized, and to govern according to your word. Protect our armed forces and all who put themselves in harm's way for the sake of others. Let them serve with honor and integrity. Bless our brothers and sisters in Christ who are suffering due to war, and bless the efforts of those who seek peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Great Physician, have mercy on the sick and those that are in need. We especially lift up to you Stacy, Linda, Jim, Gordon, Stacy, and Vicki, and all those who suffer among us. We also ask that you would be with Don Schultz as he prepares for surgery this week. We pray you would grant them renewed health, a forced foretaste of the eternal healing in Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. And dear Father, grant the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to the Geyser family, the Herzig family, and all among us who mourn the loss of loved ones. Let the dawn, dawning light of new creation in Christ sustain them in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, risen Savior, Holy Spirit, sanctifier, we join today in singing eternal alleluias and innumerable angels in joyful gatherings with the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in, in heaven and with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And we bring these petitions before you, dear Father, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, who is also our Lord, and is alive and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
as we prepare for the servant service of the sacrament. If you believe, as we do in the Lutheran Church, that Christ's body and blood is in, with, and under the bread and wine in a way we can't understand but cling to faith, then please receive with us. And if that's not what you believe or you're not sure what you believe, still, please come forward. Just have your hands crossed like this and we will give you a blessing. Lastly, if you can't come forward and want to receive pew communion, we'll bring it to you. But as we walk by, please raise your hand just so we don't miss pass, or pass by you. So with that, let us begin our service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially, are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death. And by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this, or eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Amen. Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Now go in his peace. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste, foretaste of the feast to come and the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. <laughs>